Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. Welcome uh, to church and welcome all the campuses as you join us and those watching on live stream, welcome as well. I uh, hope and pray that you're enjoying the service so far and uh, that which I've got to share this morning, I know I'm sure you'll be blessed. And so we're going to begin reading in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. I used to love it when you, everybody had opened their Bibles and turned to it, the rustle of the pages. Uh, you know, I, I miss it. It's a little bit like some of the, you know, the, the smells of old and uh, there's nothing like a paper Bible. I don't think myself. Uh, but enough to say, maybe you think I'm old school, but I love to highlight my Bible, as you can tell by my posts, and, and uh, if you're not following me on Facebook, shame on you, but no, just kidding, uh, Instagram. So, so in any case, uh, I love to highlight a Bible, and I, I read uh, one particular Bible through, uh, you know, at least three or four times until it becomes unreadable because of all the highlights. I get to, to be honest, um, highlight every verse because I get so inspired about every word. Um, and I'm not just, I'm not saying that to sound good. I just, you know, like sometimes even a butt kind of just stands out. I, you know, I put a circle around it, you know, uh, maybe an and even, you know, and or immediately or whatever. And so if you pick up my Bibles, I've got a stack at home that I've gone through about that high, I guess. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're all so highlighted that, as I said, they're unreadable now. But um, just, just love underscoring the word of the Lord. But I know most don't bring their Bible to church now. Uh, because the scriptures will be on the screen. I wonder how we'd get on if we had a power cut. You'd have to trust what I'm saying is true. That's why they used to bring your Bible, keep the preacher honest, right? Just kidding. Luke chapter 10, verse 22. All things. Now, I want all those up in the back there, in the back, to say to this lot down here, all things, as if you mean it. Come on, all things. All things. All things, thank you. Luke 10, 22. All things have been delivered to me, Jesus speaking, by my Father. And no one knows who is the Son except the Father, and the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Aren't you glad you're one of those? Give me a wave if you'll... Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed, that word blessed means happy. Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you, Many prophets and kings, and of course Jesus bridges a gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. And behold, a certain lawyer. Give me a wave, because I know we've got many either lawyers or people studying to be lawyers in the church, and uh, every young person I speak to just about studying to be lawyers. I'm not, give, give me a wave if you, if you I'm sure there's got to be at least half a dozen. There's one, two, three, anybody else? Um, Maybe the lawyers at home studying, but there's at least half a dozen, I know, young people, and, and uh, I'm looking for Ruby and others. But in any case, she is one now. She's not studying to be one. Mind you, probably doesn't stop that studying once. In any case, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Imagine testing God. The, the arrogance of it, but that's all right. Saying, teacher, good question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, remember, he was testing God. He wasn't necessarily interested in the answer. So Jesus said to him, and I love the way Jesus speaks to people. Every time you ask God a question, he kind of asks you one in return. He would have made a great politician. He never answered the question. Do you notice that? He, he always asks a question because he wants to know what you're thinking. And uh, he said, Jesus said to the lawyer, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? What is your reading of it? What's your understanding of it? Verse 27. So the lawyer said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as oneself. And Jesus said, good answer. Tick. You've answered rightly. And Jesus said, do this, and you will live. Wow. But the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, like so many people do, and here he wished, I believe he never wanted, I believe later he wished he'd never open up his mouth, but, you know, some people go one step too far. I'm always one step too far. <laughs> said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, and of course he tells him the, the story of the, of the, of the uh, Good Samaritan. Very popular, famous story in the Bible. Let's read it. Then Jesus answered, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, 
fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departing, leaving him as dead. Now, you know, I know when you read the news, so many tragic things are happening in our society. But to be honest, they've been happening uh, tragic things for a long time, right? I mean, here was a guy robbed, left for half dead. Uh, things, bad things happen even to good people. Now, by chance, that's an interesting thing that Jesus said there. By chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Sorry, did I, I messed up. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Everybody say compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured on him oil and wine, set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I come, I will repay you. So Jesus said, and asked the lawyer, so which one of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You know, there's a scripture that as Christians, we're in the world, but not of the world. That's quite difficult. And I know over the years, of course, many have tried to go and live in monasteries because it can be a challenge. Um, you know, they want to get sanctified, which means separated. And so they go and live in monasteries, put up four walls and hide behind those walls. But that's not what the scripture means. Uh, we're in the world, but not of the world. So we're in the world. We live in the world. We live among sinners. We live among society, right? We live among neighbors, friends and family and so forth. But we don't have to partake of many of the things that they do, right? The church... The church, listen now, must continue, continually make adjustments to reach an ever-changing world, but never compromise its convictions. So we've got to reach an ever-changing world without compromising our convictions. This word is still relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago, right? Society has changed. Culturally, the world has changed and ever-evolving. But the Word of God abides forever. Can I hear an amen to that? You know, when the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, the promise of the Spirit of God, the promise was God would pour out His flesh, a pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Interesting, there are only 120 in the upper room. But who knows that the laws of God are written upon everybody's heart. Everybody knows what is right and wrong. People know that it's wrong to murder. Right? That's why people go to prison for it, right? Society knows that. If they really believed in evolution and no God, no accountability, it would be the strong survive, dog eat jog, right? But people know that it's wrong. People know that it's wrong to steal, know that it's wrong to commit adultery, right? People know what, what, what is wrong. And obviously, you know, society out there is in a big mess at the moment. But people deep down, even though sometimes they see their conscience and they don't want to know what God's word says, but the laws of God are still written on their heart and their conscience speaks to them. And I know that we've all been guilty, right? Every one of us. I mean, let's be honest. I went through the Ten Commandments uh, uh, and even said the first commandment, they shall have no other God besides me. In other words, the, the, the middle letter of the word sin is I, and we've all been our own God. I praise God for forgiveness. I praise God for mercy, even for a murderer or for a thief or whatever you've done in life, right? I praise God that there's mercy and grace and forgiveness when we turn to Jesus. The blood covers us. The woman caught in adultery, you know? Jesus never condemned her. Praise the Lord. We'll talk about it. He did say, go and sin no more. There's a key there. The world never wants to remember that. They just remember the other part, right? Hello. Hello. So the thing is, is that we've all been guilty. And often we think that an idol, you should have no other gods beside me. Often we think a, a god is a little idol in the garden, like a Buddha, right? You know, that guy with a big fat belly? I've been trying to lose mine lately, but, you know, I don't want to sit in the garden. Well, I don't mind sitting in the garden, but, 
you know, Buddha, you know, they go up and rub them, believe in luck and all that kind of stuff. How stupid can you be and still breathe? And, and so people think that, you know, a god is some kind of carved idol. But no, when you think about it, it's whatever you worship. It could be yourself. It could be, could be money. It could be all kinds of things, right? You know, when you think about Adam, Adam was in the garden in paradise and the devil came along and says to Eve and uh, so forth, you will be like him, like God, right? But Adam was already like him. He just didn't recognize it. And the Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. So, listen, the power of Pentecost was the Holy Spirit. We are a Pentecostal church. I do not apologize for that. We are a tongue-talking, laying on of hands, prophetic, Holy Ghost church. Even in this culture of the day, it may not be popular today. It may not be culturally sensitive today. But I want to tell you, this book tells me. And so the thing is, we are a Pentecostal church. We're not a, a you know, I won't say a Presbyterian or Baptist or even just a slightly charismatic church. No, we're a Holy Ghost church. The power of Pentecost was the Holy Ghost. Amen. The significance of Pentecost was the birth of the church. The significance of Pentecost was the birth of the church. The church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. The effectiveness of Pentecost, the effectiveness of Pentecost, the effectiveness of Pentecost was reaching lost people, restoring humanity. Went quiet just then. You'd rather have the goosebumps than speaking in tongues. The effectiveness of Pentecost was reaching of lost people. Peter got up and preached, and 3,000 were added to the church that day. And so Jesus says to the lawyer, what, how do you read it? What's your interpretation? How do you read it? What do you say to, to, to inherit eternal life? Well, of course, Jesus said to the religious people, you must be born again. I think to some degree, I know, I, I, please don't take me wrong doctrinally. Obviously, there's a moment that we give our lives to Christ. Yes, we're saved eternally, praise the Lord. But the Bible says to work out your salvation daily. So every day, this is the day the Lord has made. Every day, we're kind of renewed. It's a new day, right? It's gone quiet in this place. And then the Bible talks about our salvation yet to be revealed without reference to sin. And so Jesus says, how do you read it? As one person put it, listen now, Christ in culture. Is Christ dynamically working in a fallen society to reconcile the world back to his Father? I know as you become religious, I know as you settle down and have walked with God for a while, you kind of think, well, they deserve it. It's their own fault, the mistakes they make. It's not that, friend. We all deserve it, right? Listen now. Christ in cultures, Christ dynamically working. He's still working. He hasn't come back yet. He's still drawing people to himself, praise God, to reconcile the world back to his Father, transforming individual lives, therefore by transforming society, because every problem in society comes from an individual's heart. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things. We talked about things. All things. All things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us. Touch yourself. I'm talking about you. Come on, some of you. You can't even be bothered doing that. Touch yourself. I'm looking at you. <laughs> talking about you this morning. Talking about me this morning. He has given us. Not the preacher, not Mary Kath, well, she's included, and so am I, given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, even though they may have deserved it, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors. That's why I got this flash jacket on. You've got to be a brave man to wear this jacket my ambassador jacket. I tried it on and still I said, Bev, it's a little loud. <laughs> Praise God for a godly wife. She said, Peter, you look great in that jacket. I said, okay. She sold me on it. And then I get home and she 
pulls out this fashion magazine. Here's Robert Graham. He's a fashion icon. And uh, his latest thing has got the jacket this color on the front page. I said, I'm cutting edge, Bev. <laughs> as long as I don't go over the edge, I'll be okay. They say, if you're standing on the edge, you're taking up too much space. I don't know, but... Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Reconciliation, friend, reconciliation of man back to God, and restoration to where it was before the fall. Because that's what the word restore means, to take it back to its original condition. Adam walking with Eve. You know, to be honest, on my small four-acre, five-acre block, as I walk around, I often find myself saying, God, I'm walking like Adam in the garden with you. You and I are together. Take care of these trees. Send some rain. Praise the Lord. He answered that prayer yesterday. I have to confess. I said, Lord, it wasn't enough. But the thing is, is that, you know, I feel, you know, like me and God are in partnership. Without him, I can't do it. But likewise, he won't do it without me. Right? He said to Adam, you tend the garden. He says to us, you've got the ministry of reconciliation. Wow. Ephesians 4, you have in the New Testament what is known as a five-fold ministry. You've got the apostle, you've got the prophet, you've got the pastor, you've got the teacher, and you're the evangelist. And of course, we know that Jesus was all those things. He was a walking church, right? The walking church. The embodiment of the church. He's a perfect church. He's coming back for a perfect church. He's the head. We are the body, right? And he told us to go into all the world. It's interesting. He told us to do something that he never did because he never traveled more than 200 miles. In fact, I'm getting on a jet plane tomorrow flying right around the other side of the world. I've got a, a conference in Rome with 100 other pastors and then I'm preaching in Paris and so forth. And, uh, uh, and I'm not sure if that's exactly what he meant by this, but he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And of course, when he said go, because even though he never went physically, he said, I am with you always. So the New Testament has a five-fold ministry. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. The Old Testament had the prophet, priest, and king. Jesus bridged the gap. He was the apostle. He was the prophet. He was the pastor. He was the teacher. He was the evangelist. He was also the prophet, priest, and king. Now, what is a prophet, priest, and king? Well, a prophet is a spokesman for God. Now, a lot of people think prophets speak prophetically into the future, tell the future. That is only a very small part. Prophets proclaim God's word. They're there to encourage people in God's word, speaking on justice and fairness and so forth, calling the nation to righteousness. Abraham was a prophet. I'm not sure whether he said anything of the future. Moses was a prophet, but Moses did speak of the future. And, and, and uh, let me read it, Deuteronomy 18. And the Lord said to me, talking to Moses, what have they spoken as good? I will raise up for them a prophet like you. So Moses was a prophet, and now God's speaking to him about Jesus. From among the brethren, so I'll put my words in his mouth. He will speak to them all that I command him. It shall be that whoever will not hear his words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. And so Jesus said, Moses spoke of me, and Jesus was the fulfillment of that. And Jesus, like other prophets, yes, he did pre predict a lot of things, but he proclaimed Mainly proclaim God's word. So he was a prophet. Jesus was also a priest. What does a priest do? A priest is there to minister to just demonstrate the love and compassion of God. He wept over Jerusalem. He reached out and touched the leper. Now in the Old Testament, the lepers were the untouchable. And I know in the New Testament, of course, you can take it like Egypt is the world and leprosy is sin, right? Eats away at people. And sometimes, as Christians, we think people are too unclean to touch. In relation to the story of the Good Samaritan, I was talking with Isaac, who's outlaying some blocks on my place, and, and uh, he's telling me the story. The Mary Captain and him were driving along just the other Friday night, and they saw this woman sitting on the side of the road, weeping and so forth. And Mary Cat said, pull over, Isaac, pull over. Isaac thought, here goes three hours. <laughs> you know, big Isaac. And in any case, they were able to minister to her, and it did take three hours. But a priest ministers compassion, compassion. 
A king, what does a king do? A king empowers a people for a productive life. I was talking to the uh, uh, amazing business people on, on Friday at Invest. And I was talking about kings and priests. Because some things God left in the Old Testament, like circumcision, and I know many of you are happy about that, right? I know for some it's too late, but it, it doesn't matter, Paul said. He left animal sacrifice, right? He left a lot of things. But there are some things he brought over. And when you read the book of Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 5, he said he made us to be a, a kingdom of kings and priests. So a priest ministers compassion, but a king empowers people and brings in provision for the vision. I was talking to them about that, and that will be online, by the way. I'm going to do a series over this year in relation to kings and priests. Because sometimes kings, when they earn a lot of money, if they haven't got a godly vision and a godly person speaking in their life, they do whoppy things with their money. I mean, I think I was saying that Evander Holyfield is a boxer, and there's a big fight on this afternoon, by the way. Yep, I care. <laughs> I mean, Tyson proclaims to be a Christian, that's why, I, but then I read what he says, and I think, whoa, that's any case, I digress. So, Evander Holyfield, he said, I tie straight off the top. He, he made millions of, I just tie straight off the top. But you take Dennis Rodman, who's a famous basketball player and made a lot of money. He spends it all on women's dresses. Not for women, by the way, for himself. People go whoppy when they have a lot of money if they haven't got a godly vision, haven't got a kingdom vision, haven't got a vision bigger than themselves. It starts to consume them. And so a king brings in provision for the vision. That's what, and, the, and plundering the marketplace. That's what the kings used to do. David got into trouble when there's a time for war and it says kings go out for battle, but David stayed at home. And so Jesus was a king. He said, I come to bring you life and life more abundantly. He empowered us. Hallelujah. He empowered us for a productive life. That's what kings do. And so every time in the Old Testament where there's a godly king and a godly priest, the nation prospered. But when maybe there was a godly king but a bad prophet, a bad priest, it didn't happen. And even you can have the best of priests like Elijah, but have a bad king, Ahab, and the nation never went anywhere, wandered aimlessly. You had to have the two ministries working together. Now listen very clear, carefully. Yes, I have a body ministry right here as a priest, as a, as a pastor. I'm also a prophet proclaiming the word of the Lord to you, and I want to be a king and empower people. But in my own home, I've got to be a king to bring in the provision for my family, right? Because Bev likes shoes. No, I'm just kidding. But, but the thing is, is that you, you may be a business person out there, whatever you are, and yes, you've got to provide for your family, but you're also a priest in your own home. You've got to minister compassion. Are you with me? And in our own lives, every one of us should have these ministries operating. In our own personal lives and in our workplace. At work, when somebody's sick or somebody is going through a marriage breakup, or so, you should minister compassion and minister God's word to them, not in a condemning way. It's amazing how there is such a difference, but a subtle difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction comes little the same as condemnation. Condemnation sets in when you won't repent. <laughs> And get it right. You feel condemned. But if you praise the Lord, turn to Jesus and ask for forgiveness, there's no longer any condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. He sets you free, right? I don't want to live under condemnation. you got to walk every day in the Spirit, the Bible says. And so, yes, I'm a prophet, priest, and king publicly to some degree, Taking up the offering, although Greg did that this morning, but bringing in provision, you know. But you guys are prophet, priests, and kings. You've got to understand this, right? Jesus gave his gifts severally when he ascended to heaven. And so Jesus, hallelujah, was a prophet and a priest and a king. And these weren't just religious titles. You don't need a title. He didn't walk around saying, I'm prophet Jesus. You don't need a title that bridges in a relationship with God. 
And I want to commission you as prophet, priests, and kings out there in the world, out there in the marketplace, to do the function of the reconciliate ministry of reconciliation. See, Jesus embodied these three ministries and he exercised them. And of course, the church is birthed out of Jesus. And now the church is to carry on the work of Jesus, right? A prophet to proclaim and declare God's word. Now, that's not easy today in our modern day society. But the word doesn't change. And so therefore, we've got to proclaim moral ethics. We've got to proclaim justice. We've got to proclaim even... Can I say it? Which is not popular preaching today. It's going quiet in this place. The wrath that is to come. I was reading the book of Revelation this morning. I'm just reading it through. And, and, uh, you know, I was reading about the seven trumpets and the seven vials. And, you know, there's, there's, and all that stuff that's coming on the earth. Sometimes we're so nice, we don't want to talk to people about it. But when the time of the Gentiles is up, And I know some might say, well, you know, they deserve it. No, I deserved it. Evan Roberts, the the preacher in the Welsh Revival, he said these words. He said, it does not behove us to go to heaven by ourselves. And so even you, though you and I are saved, we're in the ark, praise the Lord. But there's a world out there that needs saving. And so, yes, we've got to proclaim God's word and even... Warn people, that's what Jesus did, warn them of the wrath to come. He warned them about hell. Hell's not popular today. I will just tell you right now, I believe in hell. I I believe in heaven. Jesus spoke more about hell than about heaven. Hell's not a popular subject today. And, you know, fire and brimstone. And, you know, I'm not necessarily a fire and brimstone preacher, but I'm not going to shy away from the fullness of the gospel. And Jesus warned people not to go to that place. And I'm trying to warn people not to go to that place. I don't want to go there. And so the prophet proclaims God's word, the full gospel, which is not easy today. And I don't think you understand that. But we've got to do it in love. And we've got to be a priest. We've got to minister God's love and compassion. As I said, the woman in adultery, Jesus loved her. He said, I don't condemn you either. And as I said, he did say, go and sin no more. It's amazing how the world knows certain scriptures. Like, judge not and you'll not be judged. I mean, they love to quote certain, but they don't read the whole book. Hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. They they don't understand the passage that Jesus was talking about. Because in the very next breath, he said, you'll be given in this life and in the life to come. Houses and lands. And so the thing is, as a priest ministers God's love and compassion, but a king empowers people to have a productive life, brings in the provision for the vision. And so Jesus today, when you know he is interceding still for us, we've got a role to do. And so City Impact Church, yes, with all my heart, I want it to be a house of prayer. Wednesday nights. I think Wednesday night prayer service should be bigger than our Sunday service. I just don't think we should miss on prayer, prayer is what keeps the church alive. Prayer. I just got Pastor Frank's email in India. They just had 21 days of prayer and fasting in their church there. Early morning prayer meetings at 5 o'clock. And the photos, the house was packed, right? Greg, I sent it to you. I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, it's hard to get people to pray in our Western culture, in our Western churches, because we're comfortable. And I'm here to stir you and encourage you, not to condemn you, just to encourage you. You know, let's be... Christ followers. He said, my house will be a house of prayer. And so to intercede, he's still interceding for us, praise the Lord. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so the question needs to be asked, is it the same for the church? When people see us, do they see the Father? I was just doing an equip the, the first couple of churches of the book of Revelation because I want to do the whole seven oh, and put them online and, and have it there. And, you know, the amazing thing is, you know, when the apostle John on the island of Patmos, he turns around and Jesus is shining brighter than the sun. But guess what? He sees a candlestick before he sees Jesus. In other words, you know, people look at the church before they even find Jesus. They look at the car park person. They look at the usher. They look at the preacher. They look at the song leader. You know, they look at you at work. They look at you as a neighbor, right? And we reflect Jesus. It's gone quiet in this place. So how people see you is often how they see God. So when lost people 
Look at you. Do they see Jesus? Do they see a God who loves them, who cares for them? Or do they see a person who condemns them and doesn't want anything to do with them because they're a sinner? See, God loves them and cares for them. And I know we've got to proclaim righteousness and justice, but in a ministry of a priest in a love and compassionate way and empower them to live in a productive life, right? Because to save is to rescue, to rescue people, as I said, from the wrath that is to come. And we should be empowering people to live and to live righteous, yes, to grow in grace, because all else leads to death and destruction. I know the greatest challenge is dealing, if I use this term, with religious people. In fact, it was with religious people Jesus said, you must be born again. And I want to encourage you and encourage myself. Peter, stay fresh in the Lord. Don't get old. Don't get complacent. Don't settle down. Continually, God, you know, keep short accounts on those little things that we do. God, forgive me. The sinners, they love Jesus because he never condemned them. He never judged them. He never accused them because sinners do what sinners do. I've been a sinner. Most of you have, not all of you. And I praise God for the young people that we're raising up in the church today. I praise God for people that don't go down wrong paths and create mindsets and strongholds and character flaws that create huge problems later on in life in marriage and so forth. I've just done a marriage series, six 20-minute series. It'll be online. And six 20-minute series on preparing and what to look for in a partner. And I go over eight fatal flaws. If, the, if, if a person's got those eight fatal flaws, stay away from them. Save yourself a lot of problem. And also eight different relationships that won't work long term. And I also talk about the three myths of marriage. And so that will be available online as well for single people. Maybe married people will watch it as well and say, oh, I shouldn't have married them. Too late. <laughs> Too late. Got to get healed and build up in the faith. I mean, I shared openly, Bev shouldn't have ever married me. We're doing an on-the-couch session over at Mount Wellington tonight. It's going to be a riot, I know, over there. But in any case, I just praise God that we've got a church where young people can grow up in a wonderful way and live righteous lives. But I don't want them becoming complacent and looking at sinners as if, as if, you know, with disdain and, and, and looking down at them. Sinners do what sinners do. And Jesus reached out to them and showed them a better way. You know, having, as I said, been down wrong paths, I just know which is a better way. I know which is a better way. No two ways about it. Restoring man back to its original to his original mandate to fill the earth and subdue it, to take dominion and to rule and reign. And this lawyer coming to Jesus, stay with me, I'm nearly there, did not really want the answer. He just wanted to test Jesus. And the church's problem often is not their relationship with God because we love God, right, with all of our heart. If I said to any Christian here, you love the Lord your God with all your heart? Yeah. But what about your neighbors yourself? Because often the church's problem is the relationship with the world the world that we're called to reach out and impact, the world that is dying, the world that's going to hell. See, far too much of the church, we're happy behind the four walls like a monastery. We can be pretty saintly on Sunday, right? And the hap we're, ha we're happy to our claim to fame, and our claim to fame is that we know God. We're the righteous ones. We're going to heaven. Hallelujah. But while we do that, often we can ignore the heartache and the hurts of the world. And so I want you, and I want to think about it, I want you, I want to commission you even this week, because I know they'll be out there. Just find a hurt and heal it. Find a need and meet it. You, you'll have people in your workplace. You'll have people in your neighborhood. You'll have somebody, a hitchhiker. You'll have somebody that you can minister God's love and compassion to. Amazing what doors open when you just are willing. The greatest ability is availability. So the strength of the church is, of course, its relationship with God. It's the foundation and the capstone. But unfortunately, the church's isolation is excused because of their relationship with God, and we don't want to get our hands dirty too often. I mean, what an opportunity on community day. What an opportunity on community day to roll up our sleeves, and man, what an effect on a person, right? Well, and she's only one of many over the years. Now, I know we've helped some people, and they like spit in your face and you know, they're sitting on the porch drinking while we're doing all the work, right? And you think, they don't deserve it. Hands up those who've been to those places. Yeah, I've been there. And, you know, they're like, you know, I mean, it's like crazy, man. And we, we may not have that effect on everybody, but I tell you right now, it does have effect on, on many. Light overpowers darkness. 
The last time I flicked the light switch on, it worked. Right? We sang that song. And so don't worry about being contaminated. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? So who knows the work of the church is far more than just about having a relationship with God. Obviously, all that we do flows out of that. But listen, Jesus grew in favor with God and man. A lot of us just want to grow in favor with God and ignore the man part. And the two greatest commandments go together. To love God, yes, totally, but to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, as I close, think about Luke 10, think about the story of the Good Samaritan. And I just want to mention eight people in the story very quickly and give you a character synopsis of them. And maybe you could identify because these eight people, to some degree, are sitting in the church. They're definitely in the world. But here they are. First of all, you had number one, the injured man. The injured man. The lost and the hurting people. Now, there could be somebody here today that's hurting. Could be somebody here today that's lost. Welcome. But there's a lot of those kind of people out there in the world, right? No? Help me out here, church. You're tired. You want to go home. Ready for your afternoon nap. Number two, there was a thief. The thief. The bandits. Basically, these are people who are in it for what they can get out of it. Well, I didn't get anything out of worship this morning. We weren't worshiping you, my friend. I'm just letting you know. People often come for what they can get out of it. I mean, I know, I know there are people, Pastor Kimball vouchers, that show up here at City Impact Church when they're about to have a baby because they know we take care of them. And they only come when they have a baby, like every nine months. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are people who who come for what they can get out of it. They don't want to, in other words, they come to get but not to give. So many people never give hardly a dime but will take everything they can get, right? Even the prayer and whatever. And I'll, I'll pray for people who don't give. I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll believe God. But amazing how we kind of have, well, the Bible even mentioned them as thieves, right? Okay, better move on. Then there's a certain priest the expert in religion and law. This man would use the wounded and the lost as a subject and discussion point for their next committee meeting. All they do is sit around and talk about it. Christians are good at talking, right? We're good at eating and talking. Well, let's, let, let's just have a morning tea and discuss how we can reach the people, but never get actually out there and do it. And so then there's a certain Levite. He was another religious type whose identity was in his relationship with God. Probably wore the collar and the big cross around his neck and so forth, so forth. And they see problems in society. They see the needy and the hurting as someone to avoid because they don't want to get their hands dirty. They make excuses. Then there was the innkeeper. The innkeeper, he was a business person, yes, but his bottom line was profit. I said to the business people, I said, if you're in business, you should have the thought that you're in business to help other people. To serve other people, right? Profit will flow out of that. Praise the Lord for profit. We need it. But the bottom line shouldn't just be all about dollars and cents. And the hurting man, listen now, was his customer. He just wanted to make money on this guy. He, wasn't disinter he was disinterested in the need of this man. How do I know that? Because if he had an interest in him, he would have said to the good Samaritan the next morning, thanks, buddy, you've done your bit. Let me take it from here. I'll look after him. But he let the Samaritan pay the bill. And that's why I said it costs money. I was saying to somebody before, everything we do around here, even the community day to put petrol in the lawnmowers, whatever it is, costs money. And the church got to be empowered financially to fulfill the ministry of Christ. And it's only when you're above that you can reach down and help those that need lifting up. But then there's the Samaritan. The Samaritan, he was willing to sacrifice himself. And notice, please, he sacrificed his time his energy, and his money. He even put himself in harm's way. Sometimes you've got to put yourself in the firing line. It's not always easy, but you have to identify, your, you have to identify yourself with those who need Christ. Be a friend of sinners. No, don't sin to be a friend of sinners. A lot of people make that mistake. 
These people, these Samaritans, I believe these are the Christ followers, the Christians. And so we've got to have this understanding. Yes, be a prophet, proclaim God's word. Yes, be a priest and minister compassion and a king and empower people. And the Samaritans saw the injured person as a person who was worth investing in. Then, as I bring this to a close, the lawyer. The lawyer, he wanted to justify himself. He asked a question that he wished he'd never asked. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, what's your understanding of it? Let me give you the answer to your question. You go and do likewise. Because then there was Jesus. He looks at the injured. He looks at the bandit. He looks at the religious type. He looks at the lawyer. He looks at the innkeeper. And you know what Jesus says? You know what? With all your faults, with all your failings, I love you all. You are all worth dying for. Jesus reaches out to them all. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus went to the cross for them all. He went to the cross for me. He went to the cross for you. He died and rose again, that you may be born again. You may have that blood transfusion, hallelujah, from heaven, and be taken out of the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light. Jesus said, I will build my church. It'll be salt and light, salt and light. You'll follow in my footsteps. And for those who want to hear, Jesus says, you go and do likewise. Salt and light. Jesus said this, if salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing and trampled underfoot. So I want to encourage you today, be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Be a prophet in your workplace. Be a prophet in your neighborhood. Be a prophet to your unsaved family. Talk about God's word, what it says. Be a priest, a minister of compassion, and be a king helping people live a productive life. I hope and pray that this week we would find a need and meet it and find a hurt and heal it in Jesus' name.